Praise God. Praise God. Please take your seat for a moment as I take my time to introduce our teacher for tonight. Uh, we are on day two of the Worship on Wednesday series as we talk about the spirit of money. And the question has been asked, does money have a spirit? All right, we try to answer part of the question, that question last Wednesday when we started with understanding money. Praise God. We started with understanding money and part of the introduction last last Wednesday, I said that uh, we think about money, we work for money, we save money, we spend money, we even tight our money, and we even stress over money. But the truth is that even though money is not as essential to God for us as we have considered it to be, a large part of our life revolves around making money, spending it, and using it as, as, as bragging rights. People have been known to have killed for money. Some have died for money. There are people who have jumped off the Todd Monland Bridge because of money issues. As a matter of fact, if I ask everyone here to give me an idea of a number one to ten issues that you deal with every day maybe number one to nine will be about money and so somebody else say if you can solve the money problem you have solved half of the human problem but the truth is money is the smallest level of wealth and that's why we understood that uh, from the principles of money that we looked at last week, that God owns everything, money is a tool and that we're supposed to worship God with money and in order to get that money, we have to give value. Praise God. And the other thing we should do about money is to fight for contentment and kill the greed in our hearts so that we do not you know, go beyond God's will for us and we're told to manage to be mindful of debts and to manage our finances and we understood last week also that more money means more issues to deal with praise god so quite a lot of things that we learned last week we learned that there are over two thousand or more scriptures about money in the entire bible and that god spoke by Christ and other people, especially Christ, about money than even salvation and faith. <laughs> Praise God. But all of that is to enable us to understand that we are supposed to be masters of money and not to make money uh, our idol. Praise God. So, if you want to know more about what we discussed last week, please get the audio, go to potbean.com uh, you'll find it, find uh, the message for last Wednesday potbean.com just look for Godwin Oguche Ministries and you will find us, you'll find all the catalog of our messages right there, you can download them on your devices and it will be very helpful for you when it comes to money, we either worship wealth or we use wealth to worship God Praise God. So that forms the basic introductory stuff that we dealt with last week. Tonight, as we continue on this journey, on day two of this discussion, on the spirit of money, how to be in charge as a believer, I have a brother and a friend, a co-laborer, a co-crime committer on the issues of money and entrepreneurship is a development uh, expert a management leadership coach he is a writer he is a speaker um, where there was a period some three four years ago when we want to introduce him we just say Ola speaks and he writes praise God as we evolve, we're also doing quite a lot of things. 
praise God. But the story between me and Ola is to be told in a forum. But each time he comes around to speak, he releases a part of it. And you now wonder, uh, so pastor went through this. But in the, in, 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 you know, in the midst of it all, God kept growing us. We kept moving from one level to the other. And so he's here today, and I value his input to this subject matter. And so he's going to be talking to us on the subject, the, the fear of money as the beginning of poverty. So I'd like for you to join me and welcome Pastor Ola Barnabas. God bless you, sir. All right, I appreciate that. Can we celebrate Jesus now? Can we be on our feet? I want us to pray together before we go into the word tonight. Father, we thank you for today. For your grace, for your strength. For your wisdom that fuels us, thank you because of your word that is sharper than any two-edged sword that pierces through the spirit, cutting through and dividing the bow from the marrow. Thank you because, indeed, you are the one who made us, who knows us, who knows our end from the very beginning. You are the one who has proposed that today, at such a time like this, we'll be here listening to such a message as this. We give you praise because of that which you have set your mind to accomplish in this place today. Trust him that that which you will do, nothing will thwart. And your name will be exalted forever. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Please celebrate Jesus as you take your seats. I celebrate uh, my friend and brother, Pastor Godwin Oguche, for this wonderful privilege. It's good to see our faces again. Mama, it's good to see you again. Zakia, everybody, I'm just happy to, you know, this is home for me. So anytime I come here, I'm home. Amen. I want to bless God for everybody who has continued to hold the fort here. My desire for you is that your purpose of being in this assembly will find expression in your life. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Uh, some years ago when I was a teenager, you know, and we had this uh, crusade that was going to take place in our, in our city then, uh, my dad, after all the announcement had gone on radio and everywhere and everywhere, and everybody was looking forward to the crusade, my dad called me because I told him I was going to attend. And he said, do you know who is going to speak at that event? I said, yes, I know. Then he asked me, I said, uh, Idahosa. Then he said, do I know who they say Idahosa is? I said, well, I don't know. I just know that uh, there's going to be a crusade and I want to attend. And he said, they said he's the richest Christian. How can somebody have so much money like that and it's called a Christian? And, well, long story short, I didn't go for the crusade. Somehow, somehow, my dad talked me out of it. It's, it's amazing that I'm the one talking about money today. <laughs> and exactly on the 10th anniversary of his death, today marks the 10th day my dad left to be with the Lord. And I'm here talking about money. It's amazing. You know, the way God works is just amazing. It's just amazing. How many of us believe money is evil? That person didn't come to church today. Amen. 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 Let's open our Bibles very briefly to the book of Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. We will take um, about seven verses from verse 9 to 16. Does the Bible talk about money in the book of Acts? I don't know. Well, let's look at it together. Acts chapter 10 from verse 9 to 16. 
I'll take a quick read so we can beat the time. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the mount, the housetop, to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet neat at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air and there came a voice to him rise peter kill and eat but peter said no not so lord for i have never eaten anything that is common or unclean and the voice spake unto him again the second time what God had cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. You know, there are some people who are holier than God. They know the Bible more than the spirit behind the Bible. The title for tonight says, The Fear of money, but I think from the original uh, expression, the Bible talks about the love of money. And if we're going to take an inverse of that word, the opposite of love would not be fear. I think Pastor God was trying to be euphemistic by using the word fear and not call it what it's supposed to be hate. Because the opposite of love is hate. So some people don't. They don't, the reality is that they hate talking about money. In the house of a poor person, money is a taboo. Talking about money is a taboo. While they sit about dinner or breakfast or something, they never mention the topic because it always brings about fight. So the inverse, what you're supposed to actually say is hating money is the beginning of poverty. But do people really hate money? Do people really hate money? I doubt if anyone will agree that they do. But then, can we look at that again? Do people really hate money? People may not say it that they do hate money. But by the way they relate with money, it is obvious that they hate money. It's obvious that they hate money. You know... People refuse to apply the principles that surround wealth building and they expect to get the result of wealth. You hate money. People refuse to associate themselves with anything that has to do with, you know, growing, growing a, a wealth foundation or laying a foundation for prosperous living. They may not say it, but they hate money. They sit in judgment over those who have money. Have you seen anybody who sees somebody who has money and the only thing he has to say about that person is that, eh, don't mind him. Only God knows what he did. They always, everybody who has money to their mind always did something. All of this kind of attitude showing disdain towards appearance of money is actually hatred towards it. It's hatred towards it. May I ask us a few questions? Is money good? And I want an answer. Is money good? Okay. So the answer is yes, right? Do we need money? Ah. In case you see money, please help me tell you that I'm looking for it. <laughs> Can we do more good in the kingdom of God with money? With more money? Can we improve our own lives with more money? So if the answer to all of these questions are yes, then why do we hate money? Why is it that we have the appearance of people who do not want to attract money? This may not be for us, particularly speaking to you now. But like I said, it may not be things that have emanated out of your mouth. But by the way you do things, you might be showing some disdain towards money without knowing it. Unconsciously. You might be. You might be. A lot of us are akin to Peter in the book of Acts chapter 10 that we read. You know whom God 
gave a revelation of meal being dropped down from heaven, of four-footed beasts. But holy Peter does not eat unholy meat. So he told God, no, I've never eaten anything unclean. And God said, don't call anything I have made common. First time, second time, the third time, until that thing was lifted back. Peter continued to argue his way, even with the creator of all things, who made all things for himself. He continued to feel like he knew better. That same attitude of Peter towards what appeared to be unclean is what a lot of people have towards money. And we may not necessarily blame them directly because a lot of churches today have made the issue of money uh, a very difficult subject. A lot of pastors have talked about money in such a way that they make it look like uh, you are dead. <laughs> I like the way Pastor opened it when he was talking about it this evening. That one of the foundations that was laid is the fact that, you know, money is not useful to God. It is us who need it. It's a tool for us to operate with. But the way some people have positioned money, the way they have talked about money, oh, God have mercy. You will leave that place depressed if you don't have money. You go to some places and if you, if God helps you to leave that place with your full self intact, God really helped you. Because by your appearance at that place, they will make you feel worthless than you are really worth. That's what money has turned to, especially and unfortunately in the house of God. Especially and unfortunately in the house of God. But there are, there's also the other extreme of people who think that money is not good. You know, I once encountered somebody who I greeted during the Christmas period. Happy Christmas. And he looked at me and said, why are you greeting me happy Christmas? <laughs> then I was like, okay, what am I supposed to say? I said, somebody was born, a child was born, and you're saying happy Christmas? And this is supposed to be a Christian. I mean a Christian, serious Christian, right? And he told me that the only time people should really rejoice is during Easter. I knew I had met a kill joy, so I just left it. There's people you don't argue with. They have chosen their path. There's something you can talk to them about. They have made up their mind on what they're going to say about what they are saying. When it concerns the issue of money, there are people like that. They have blocked their mind as far as money is concerned that it is people like this who do this kind of things for money. It is someone who has money is an automatic enemy to them. People who are working towards making their lives better financially, they are automatic enemies. They are the kind of people who would rather stay in church on Monday morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, rather than go to work. And so every morning of the weekday, they are in church praying, rather than working. They are such people. They have an aversion to the issue of money. To my mind, these are the real haters of money. They are the real haters of money. The Bible is never against money. Never. There is no part of the Bible that is against money. You don't want to quote the scriptures that kind of support our biased positions. For example, we'll quote scriptures like, I think that's First Timothy, right? That says, uh, the love of money is the root of all evil. We quote scriptures like that, and we try to justify our position without even thinking about what we are quoting ourselves. The Bible never said money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money. But we have made it so much like the Bible does not need to put love or it just needs to remove that love and put money straight. <laughs> money is the root of evil. Come on, forget about love of it. <laughs> we have come to that point where we have become a Peter. We have become a Peter. We have known more than God in the subject of money. When it was declared categorically in the Bible that money answereth all things. All things. All things. Christians are going to go to heaven and enjoy the company of God in heaven and of angels and everything. But while on the earth, Christians should also enjoy what God has put on the earth. I don't want to be a Christian who only works for heaven. Heaven is guaranteed for me by God's grace because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have confessed him as my Lord and Savior. 
I walk in his way and as much as possible, as possible for me as human, I try to keep his counsel and his precepts. And I walk in sync with the Holy Spirit. Why should I be afraid of what's going to happen next? But while I'm, a, while I'm here on earth, I want to maximize the life of God has given unto me. I want to maximize it. I don't want to go to heaven and suddenly be shown that there's one mansion I'm supposed to have built or owned on earth that cannot be transported to heaven. I want to have everything I can have on earth. And when I get to heaven, I want to have everything I can have in heaven. There are gold in heaven, but let me enjoy the one on earth first before I go there. Because even here, there is gold. Even here, there is silver. And you know the, be the beautiful thing about that? My father owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Silver and gold are his. And you know, God is so magnanimous that it is out of his bounty, out of his fullness that I have received and grace for grace. The one he has on earth are not to be taken to heaven because heaven has shortage of them. No. There's enough in heaven and enough on earth for as many of his children as will be interested in taking charge and taking part of them. I think the first place where we need to start from is from making up our mind that we are going to get the best that God has for us as children of God. We need to start from that point. That we are going to take all that God has for us. Not some, not a subset, not a part of. We are becoming too complacent as Christians. A little is just enough. That's not the kind of life God wants for us. That's not the kind of life God wants for us. God does not see money the way we see it. Even the Bible does not see the money the way we see it. And you know, the, be the beautiful thing for that is that the people to whom our faith was entrusted at the beginning do not even see money the way we see it. I'm talking of the Jews. I'm going to give you some statistics that will kind of help us to understand what I'm talking about. The Jews don't see money the way most Christians see money. As a matter of fact, I, I tried to dig out some things about how Jews relate with money. And it was amazing. It was amazing. The Jews or Jewish people teach their children that money is a beautiful thing to aspire to acquire. Money is a beautiful thing to have. They teach their children. They teach them. We have beautiful educational system, but it is derelict in knowledge as far as money is concerned. People go to study money management in school and know nothing about money after graduation. So the Jews don't wait for the school system to teach their children about money. They do. They do. They teach them that their father, who is the originator of the Jewish system or the Jewish culture or Jewish religion, who is Abraham, was never poor. Have you thought about Abraham before? A man that had servants. Bible recorded 318 of them. Servants. I have children at home. Sometimes I have people come to live with me. And I know what it takes sometimes to feed. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. Every family man here can attest to what I'm talking about. To feed five mouths per night. Or per day. And you do that consistently. Abraham didn't have five. He didn't have ten. He didn't have a hundred. He didn't have two hundred. He had 318 servant. And that's, you know, when they count in the Bible, they count of a particular sex. So, that was the male. They had children, they had wives. And he fed them every day. That was not a poor man. I mean, if that was the only thing he did. <laughs> if that was the only thing he did, he was not a poor man. And so the Jews make sure they teach their children that look at your father of faith. Look at the person who instituted this culture we call Jew. He was a very poor man. They talked about Isaac. You know, Isaac took from Abraham and he continued to, to, to perpetuate the wealth that God gave unto Abraham. At one time, Bible recorded of Isaac whose servant had dug so many wells and these guys, you know, who were the, their, their hosts, they blocked every well that he had dug. The Bible made mention of particularly three wells that were later dug. The first one was a sec the second one was Sitna, and the third one was Rehoboth. After which he now said, This far, God has brought us. You know, well of water in those days is like well of, I mean, uh, it's like uh, oil well today. 
because it was a major, major stream of income. It was, it was like, if you want to value people by Forbes, those are the kind of things you count. In their days, Isaac was such a person, a wealthy man. Talk about Jacob. Talk about Jacob. Jacob's wealth streamed until Egypt in Goshen. You know, his child, Joseph, went into Egypt and then he inhabited a particular area and gave Goshen unto his father. So, their, that lineage did not, their wealth did not stop in Israel alone. It entered into a foreign land. And so the Jews make sure they teach their children these things. That their, their forebears were never poor. Never, never poor. You hear statements like this, where there's no flower, there's no Bible. It's from the Mishnah in the Jewish culture. Where there's no flour, there's no Bible. You know flour, flour that you use in making dough, in making bread. And Where there's no flour, there's no Bible. That's what they teach their children. <laughs> they teach their children that poverty causes transgression. How many of us believe that? When you are poor, it's easy to sin. Hi. Sin comes naturally with poverty. I think they are Siamese twins. Sin and poverty. Do you notice that you, you don't really hear well when you are poor? It's something that just blocks it. I'm serious. So, people talk to you and they think that you are not, you are not heeding the counsel that I give you. It's not like you are not listening. You are just not hearing them. Ne? Something blocks your ear. I, I always give this instance of the time when I was way back in school in the Loring. And I'd be hungry. I'd be hungry for two days. No food. Not that I didn't want to. I was was first fast. <laughs> so I was going home. One of those days, I think the second day, of course, completely knocked out. I was just thinking on my life and on what my, <laughs> my life was going to turn out to become. You know, hunger just makes you think somehow. So I was just going home and there was this woman who was driving behind me. Unfortunately for me or her, either for one of us, she was blaring the horn of the car. I didn't hear Jack. And she continued to blow the horn. I didn't hear anything. It was poverty. It blocked my ears. But eventually she was able to meander away and she just rolled down her glass and insulted the life out of... I just looked at her. Even the strength to return the favor I didn't have. So I just allowed her to go. I just kept looking at her. Madam, just go. Just don't even drive fast before you the wave I mean, the air of your car will, will knock me. Just go, just go, come on. That's what poverty can do. Poverty causes transgression, it causes sin. Poverty causes sin. It is it is a Hasidic in, in one of the Jewish uh, um, uh, teachings. They call it Hasidic. It's Hasidic teaching. So they teach their children to not be poor. They teach their children that poverty in a man's house is worse than 50 plagues. <laughs> that came from the Talmud. Poverty in a man's house is worse than 50 plagues. 50. You know, if anybody understands plagues, the Israelites do. At least, by the power of God, they were able to show the Egyptians 10 of such. It's worse than 50 plagues put together. That's what they teach their children. So their children know that to be poor is to be plagued. Now, this is where I'm going. When you look at how the Jewish people have evolved over time versus other people who share customs that are similar to theirs, you will know that Getting to raise their children with this knowledge has really impacted them. The entire Jewish population in the world is less than 16 million today. Entire Jewish population, entire from Israel to anywhere, the entire Jewish population is about 15 point something million. But do you know that of the 10 wealthiest people in America, Jews are five of them? Of the ten, number one, two, three, four, Mark Zuckerberg is a Jew. Bloomberg is a Jew. 
per the brim of Google is Jew. Of the, you can't number one to ten in America, five of them, five of the first ten are Jews. Fifteen, I think fifteen point one million people or something. That's the number. Total population. You know, there are in the Forbes list of wealthiest persons, the list in the first four hundred, Jews make up thirty five percent. 35% of the wealthiest 400 in the world, Jews make up 35%. Uh, there are recorded number of about 21 billionaires who are Jews. 21. I, didn't, I don't know whether you understand what I'm talking about. There are 15.1 million people and 21 of them are billionaires in dollars. 21. Nigeria has a population of over 200 million. Every year, Forbes is trying to look for million, uh, billionaires to bring. They are trying to look for. So even some people that are not, they don't even know how they just be a billionaire, just be one, at least add up to the number. They just make it up somehow, you know? So they are able to count at least, uh, count sometimes four, five, six in Nigeria. I'm talking of a people, 15.1 million. That's like the population of a Kano state. I think that's even far less. If it really counts. I mean, you can't compare that with Lagos anyway. An entire race. An entire culture. 21 of them are those who are recognized. And you know the Jewish people, some of them, they don't even want to be known. If you really know them. They are just, they are as silent as can be. But the recorded ones, 21 of them, billionaires. Of the multi-millionaires in Jew in, in, in US, sorry, of the multi-millionaires in US, Jews make up one third of the entire multi-millionaires in US. Now I'm trying to paint a picture for us. Because you see, we have to get to this point where we are seeing that what we are doing eventually impacts our future. What we are doing impacts our future. Decisions we take today impact our, our future. The things we, we, we impact into the life of our children. The kind of knowledge we soaked when we were younger impacts what we are today. It's a big definition for where we are today. If we knew better, we would be better today. So if our children know better, it is, it is non-negotiable that tomorrow they will be better. But then, they talk about money in the house, you pick offense. They want to discuss money in the house. Why, why are you talking about money? Every time money, every time money. And the last time was last year. But for you, every time is money, every time money. Why are you angry? Why do people get angry when they hear subject of money? When issue of money is raised in church, the first set of people who are going to be angry are those who are not going to contribute anything. Or those who don't have anything to contribute. They are the ones who are mostly angry when money issues are raised in church. Have you not observed it? Okay, maybe not church. Around you. Around you. You want to test your friend, just talk, just mention it to your friends that you probably need some money for something. Look at those who are going to first escape. There are those who are not going to give anything anyway. Yet, they will run away. Because poor people are money. They have inverse relationship. They are enemies. Some people are not poor because, not because, it's not because money cannot come to them, but because they are constantly running away from money. How? By the kind of life they have put out. People hate money. It is true. Sometimes they don't know that they do, but they really do. <laughs> they really do. They really do. They really do. Oh, God. The Jews, I learned a lot from them. I learned a lot from them. When it comes to subjects like this, Subjects of business, subjects of money, I just want to look towards the direction of the Jews. And I don't think there's any race that is a greater custodian of God's wisdom than the Jews. I don't think of any. And I think there are not any, actually. There are not any. Ladies and gentlemen, we must come to that point where we are consciously, consciously eager to get into the place of wealth. I don't know if that makes any meaning. 
We are consciously eager to get into it. We walk consciously to get into the place of wealth. It is not wrong to be wealthy. It is not a sin to be wealthy. God does not hate you. Well, you are, as a matter of fact, I think you are happier. God is happier. Because if we give him less trouble. He's happier because you can take care of other people's troubles. You can. You can. You can save some people some unnecessary prayer points with your money. You can bring some people closer to God with your money. Some people give reasons why they are not going to serve God. And you answer that reason before it ever came up. You have contributed. We must work consciously, consciously towards getting to the place of wealth. We must work consciously towards it. The fear of money, it is said, is the beginning. The beginning of poverty. Look, let me put it categorically that no one of us, none of us can own or possess what we constantly quarrel with. I don't know if you heard that. Whatever you constantly quarrel with, whatever you constantly have an issue with, you can never attract. You can never attract. You can never attract. You can never attract. Having money is not a problem. It is a lack of it you should fear. Hmm? Having money should never be a problem. It is the lack of money that you should fear. We should never be afraid of money. We should be afraid of lacking money. Uh, there, is, there is a popular African expression that says that money is the will of the gospel. You want the gospel to run fast. It's money that is the will. You see missionaries who are all over the place in the unthinkable places in the world. Do you think that those people will do better sharing the gospel if they have support? A steady support system. Do you think they will do better if they know that their children's school is secured? Can we talk together? Do you think they will preach better? They will serve God better? They will be able to go to places that you can never go to if they know that their children will not be dropouts in school? So, why don't we walk into a point where we can be those who can be their own backbone, who can support them, who can continue to make, I mean, hold their hands like Moses' hands were held. Why don't we walk to becoming that? Let's never get settled with too little. You settle too soon, you settle too small. You settle too soon, you settle too small. You get content with too little. You get content too early. Too early. Now does that not talk about boundary? Of course, there are boundaries in the word of God. And if you're a Christian, you'd even, you don't even need to be told what the boundaries are. Because you know them already, by default. There are things you shouldn't do because of money. There are some kind of things that you must never get your hands into because you're looking for money. But the things that are legitimate, can you look yourself in the mirror and say that you have given all your best to making it work for yourself? All of us are striving towards excellence in different areas. The results we are going to get will be determined much more than by any other thing by what we give into it. By what we give into it. Ladies and gentlemen, God's knowledge is never scarce. And I know that in an assembly like this, by God's grace, knowledge is not a scarce thing. It's not a scarce commodity. I know that at least I'm sure of that. From this altar, I know knowledge is not a scarce commodity. What matters more is the application of what we constantly hear. Application. It is not the hearers of the word. It is the doers that profit with it. The doers that profit with it. If we hear the word alone, we deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves. Somebody can come here and teach you 55 principles of money making. How many of them are you going to use when you leave the church hall? How many? If only we take one and run with it, I can guarantee that that one will deliver results for us that will be immense. I'll leave you with one principle. 
And that's where I'm going to be rounding up. In Kano, where we live, just like in every other place, success or wealth building responds to the kind of environment or what operating environment that you live in. Let me put it another way. There is a language of the environment in which you operate. If you don't speak that language, you will never be able to maximize what comes from that environment. And when I say language, I'm not talking about Hausa or Yoruba or Igbo or whatever. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the language of business or the language of career or the language of whatever that your environment speaks. When Pastor Godwin and I started, we started by speaking a particular language. It's what we knew. We gave it the best shot we could. But the environment does not understand that language. And so we struggled for too long. There is a language this environment understands. You see people make millions every day. They make blah, blah, blah every day in Kano and everything. It's because they speak the language of the environment. What's Kano's business language? Trade. This is what I have to sell to you. This is what you are paying for it. So give me the goods, take my money. That's it. So if you are not going to be speaking that language and you want to speak the kind of language they speak in Lagos or any other place that is not applicable here, you'll be breaking the rock with a knife. And rather than break the rock, it is the edge of the knife that will destroy. No results. We spoke that language for only God knows how long. Years. We knocked on doors. I mean, the only door we didn't knock on was the, door, was the one that was not available. Every available door we knocked. Every, and this is it's practical. As Gunduwawa, Jogana, Gezawa, those regions can bear us witness. The only factory we didn't enter was the one that was not available. As far as there's a factory there we're going. If Gateman says no, one of them will enter, the other one will stand with the Gateman. It's like that. We must enter. But do you know that all of that yielded very little results? Because it was not the exact language of the location. Today, by God's grace, we do far better because we have also understood the language of the environment and we are speaking it. Hi. That's a principle. That's a principle. So you might want to continue to do what you have always done and continue to get the kind of result you have always got. But if you tweak it a little bit to what the environment speaks and you try to dig further in that particular direction, maybe, just maybe, you can get your own Reho box. Maybe. But there are many more principles like this one. But like I said, are you going to use them? Or are you just going to hear them and tick them? Are you going to use them? Or are you just, you're just going to hear them and pretend like they're just going to work because you've heard them? Ladies and gentlemen, money is not far from us. By the grace of God. We have a very special advantage. You know that advantage? We are children of God. It does not suffer his only ones to see corruption. Never. It may look like it's tough and rough and all of that, but God does not suffer his holy ones to see corruption. No. He takes care of his own. That's an advantage. Let's maximize it. Let's maximize it. Let's maximize it. Money will come to you. I said money will come to you. Much more than you ever hoped or thought or dreamed about. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let's pass this knowledge to our children. Let's pass it on. Let's pass it on. Let's have discussions with them. Let's have discussions with them. Sometimes I think our academic system is doing more damage than good. I think it is. Necessarily speaking. I'm not saying children should not go to school. My children are in school by God's grace. But I know that it's not that school. It is my school that will produce more results for them. 
So I'm the teacher. We sit down and we talk about things. Life. We sit down and talk about things. Business. We, they have to know these things early. I don't want to read about the children of the Jews alone and not produce a Jew in my own house. We must take these things upon ourselves and make our children better than we ourselves. Amen. Amen. Do you love the Lord? Please celebrate him. Celebrate him. Celebrate him. <laughs> Father, we thank you for the privilege of your word one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because we know that your word has indeed come to us and will produce results in us. Beyond our wildest imagination and dreams. I pray very specially for your people here today that they will leave this place, run with the word they have heard, and produce maximum results in their lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. We want to hear continuous stories of improvement, of expansion, of glory, of improvement in glory in this assembly. This is our desire. This is our prayer. And we know that everything we commit into your hands, you are more than able to deliver into our hands. This is our desire. We receive it by faith and with thanksgiving. In the name of God the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Celebrate Jesus one more time. have been richly blessed by that message. Should you require further counseling, we are reachable via our social media platforms. On Facebook, we can be found at Living Hope International Christian Center. On Instagram, we are at Living Hope Can. Our WhatsApp number is 080 and you can call us on 081-564-87696. If you are in Kano or visiting, you can worship with us at Hall 3, the Researchers Nursery and Primary School, 122-128 Egbe Road, Kano, Nigeria. Our Sunday worship is 9 a.m. while our worship on Wednesday holds at 6 p.m. Remember, you are too blessed to be stagnant.